All right, welcome everybody. Um, welcome to the third installment of the Pensando Chibanya Roundtable Series. My name is Mary Kate Donovan. I'm an assistant professor of Spanish at Skidmore College. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to today's dialogue, which will center on questions of activism and education. So today's event is the final for the spring 2021 calendar. I see a number of familiar faces in the audience and I wanna thank all of you for joining us and participating throughout this series. Um, for those of you joining us for the first time, welcome and thank you for coming. I also want to thank our sponsors. This event series has received generous support from various departments, programs and centers at Stony Brook University including the Graduate Student Organization, the Department of Hispanic Languages and Literatures, the Department of Asian and Asian American Studies, the Women, Gender and Sexuality Department, the Institute for Globalization Studies, and the Charles B. Wang Center. This series is also sponsored by my home department, the Department of World Languages and Literatures at Skidmore College. So although this is the final event in the inaugural series of roundtables, we look forward to sharing more programming with you in the future. If you've missed the events that we had in February and March, um, or if you, would if, you, if you were there and you would like to share them with your students, colleagues, friends, et cetera, you can find the recordings at pensandoshipanya.com and we'll put the link in the chat. You can find the um, events under the past events tab in the menu bar. And they're also available on our YouTube channel. channel. Um, so our roundtable today will be moderated by Hassan Bendahan, excuse me. He is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Hispanic Languages and Literatures at Stony Brook University. His research studies the visualization of ethnicity in comics and graphic novels, focusing on the depiction of Asian American and Latinx communities in the US. His work is currently funded by the Humanities New York Public Humanities Fellowship, through which he is implementing a project called Empowering Through Visual Narratives, a workshop series that engages with middle school students to read and create comics. He is also the recipient of the President's Award for Excellence in Teaching by a Graduate Student at Stony Brook University. So now I'm going to pass the mic virtually to Moises, who will introduce our three speakers today that I'm very excited to dialogue with. Thank you, Mary Kate. We are going to uh, start the conversation uh, of Pensando Sibania, as Mary Kate said. This panel is going to be activism and education. Um, we are very honored to have uh, Antonio Liu Yang, Ines Herrero, and Yue Fu. Uh, let's introduce uh, each one of them, and they are going to talk a little bit about themselves. First of all, we have Antonio Liu Yang. He's an inter intercultural consultant, lawyer, and multi-sector uh, project manager. He's the founder of Mediterranean Co uh, Consulting, and he's faculty of the uh, Universidad Católica San Vicente Martir, de Valencia as a professor of Chinese culture and language. You could find him in social media, uh, Santiago Luyang, both in, in Instagram and in Twitter. Antonio? Yes, thank you, Moises, for having me for this event. Uh, it's a big challenge because my English is not good enough to have like a two hour conversation. So uh, I know all the audience, uh, you can speak Spanish. So maybe I will come out with uh, some Spanish slang so sorry about that. Uh, thank you for choosing these three pictures. I uh, will start the first one is a TEDx talk in the north of Spain, like two years ago. Uh, I was carrying a lot of weight, <laughs> more than now. So the topic was the, the Chinese, the young Chinese community in Spain. Uh, the second picture is me uh, like 10 years ago. So it's the first, uh, one of the first talk I was uh, taking in, this one was in the business school and the topic was the, the myth and the urban agent, uh, legends of the Chinese community in Spain. Like your Chinese people, you never die, you never pay tax and things like that. So uh, I think everyone in Spain uh, was saying that 10 years before, 10 years ago. So, and the third picture, 
I will, uh, I'm holding like a big paper. I'm not a virus. It's the Spanish version of the campaign. I'm not a virus. So it starts like a, yeah, yeah. last year, yes, last year, February last year. Uh, and it had a, a huge uh, impact in the, show, in the media in Spain. It seems that it was 10 years ago, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, our following guest is Ines Herrera. Ines is an activist and linguist student. student. She's the founder of Anti-Racismo uh, anti Asiatico. Her undergrad thesis deals with, um, the, with the first language acquisition among uh, adoptees. Um, Ines? Yeah, uh, hi everyone. I'm Ines Herrero from Anti-Racismo Asiatico. And to introduce myself, I will say that I was born in China and I lived there uh, till my mother adopted me when I was 10 months. And then uh, she brought me to Spain where I have lived my entire life. Now I'm currently 22 and I am studying Spanish letters. And also at the same time, I'm working on anti racism Asiatico project uh, that it's an online platform where I try to give uh, the voice uh, to those who has never been heard. So I try to give interviews uh, to uh, adopted children as me from Asia, to uh, students who have came uh, to study in Spain, or also to explain what actions are racist in our daily life that maybe uh, we haven't thought about. And I don't know, recently I've also made a web page where I think I can uh, um, explain myself better uh, more than on Instagram, but it's true that I am mostly on Instagram because I think it's the best place uh, where I can uh, be with people near my average of age. Um, well, on the other hand, uh, into linguistics, uh, I try to uh, join my academic project to my social one. So I decided to uh, start investigation um, to uh, linguistics, like the, all the um, linguistic processes that adopted children uh, suffer uh, at the moment when they are adopted, that they are so many. And I think that process is, is a void. And it is so important because a uh, language is uh, that character that uh, permitted us to uh, express ourselves. And when we are adopted and we come we, uh, to, uh, from other countries, uh, we have nothing. So uh, that processes are important to study, uh, to try to have uh, the best options or the best tools for helping uh, that children than, that come from adoption. Okay, thank you, Ines. Last but not least, uh, Yue Fu. He, she's an intercultural mediator who works with the Chinese community in Madrid. She's graduated in psychology and has a master on, on social work. She's the co-founder of the Liwai as Action, Action Cultural, Intercultural, and you could find her on Instagram, uh, Liwai I. And, the website is liwai.org. Hello, everyone. First of all, thank you, Ines. I thank, sorry, thank you, Moises and uh, Mary Kate, for inviting us to this round table. It's my, it's my honor to be here. And uh, my name is Joy. I'm 28 years old, and I came from a migrant family. I came to Spain with uh, 14 age, from 14, with 14 years. Uh, and I studied psychology, and uh, it's, it was a good opportunity for me to become an uh, intercultural uh, mediator for the Chinese community three years ago, because as a teenager, as a child, I, I've always dreamed about being a person who is useful for the Chinese community. So three years ago, I began doing the uh, intercultural mediation in the, in the Chinatown of Madrid, we call, or sometimes we call it Chinatown, but it's not officially a Chinatown. It's the district of Ucera of Madrid. And what I do, um, uh, what I do specifically in this district is doing a um, social accompaniment to the Chinese uh, migrant collective, which means I do, uh, I make some, uh, I make personalized orientation for them 
people can ask me, especially Chinese people, they can ask me about everything that, that they want to know about the social service, the public services. And they can ask me, for example, how to make appointment in the city council and what, what kind of social benefits can I apply for given my personal or familiar situation. So in that cases, we, I make appointment for them. I accompany them physically to the social services and I do Spanish Chinese translation interpretation for them. And also besides that, I also do design and organize uh, intercultural activities for all the citizens of this district. As you can see in the second photo in the middle, we were doing a performance with uh, women uh, come, that come from different cultures, just like Arabic, Spanish, Latin, and Chinese. And we did a performance together on the day of, on the Women's Day. And also in the last picture, we were doing a, a calligraph, Chinese color, calligraphy activity with the Spanish older people. And also, we, I also do some informative and formative sessions for the Chinese people in the district. We, uh, I, I teach them how to, uh, I, I try, I let them, them to know what is, for example, what is social, how the pro social protection system works in Spain and how the, how the education system works in Spain, that kind of issues to let, to let them know how to, um, to let them know more about the, the local society and the public services. That's what, what I do in my, in my job. And also like, like uh, Moise said, I co-founded the association Li Wai which aims to, bre uh, to, 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 to build a bridge between the Chinese community and the rest of Spanish society. So what right now, and for example, this year, doing, we are trying to do some small projects, intercultural projects with young Chinese people. If you want to know more about us, you can just um, uh, visit our website and you'll find some more projects and activities that we do in the year. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. So it's very, uh, it's my pleasure to have this conversation because we are going to explore different levels of activism and involvement that deals with both public sphere, uh, private sphere and, uh, and social media, and both all related to education in different ways also. Uh, I'm, going, I'm going to make the, qu the first question in this regard, which will be, um, is there a proper way to do activism? And if so, do you think of yourself as an activist? Antonio? Mm, oh, yes. should, should I start? Oh, you are. Yes, yes okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was the, the last one. Okay, no. <laughs> activism is, I think, is a, a very strong word. Or oh, people doesn't know the real meaning of, of, of that word. For me, um, my perception is more like a change maker. So everyone has a, a causa, a cause to fight. And you have to learn how to defend uh, and fight for your cause. That's my opinion about uh, activism or uh, change maker. Yeah. So what, what do you think? Yeah. Uh, for example, okay. In my case, actually, um, this question comes from me because when, um, when Moises told me that I was included in, in this roundtable about education and activism, and, I'm, and my first reaction was, oh, really, I don't consider myself self as an activist. And why is that? Because I've always considered that an activist is a public person who is very active in the public sphere, just like political issue, issues or, or fighting against uh, some social injustice like racism and who aims to, to do this maybe um, as a career, as a professional um, goal. But in my case, I always um, consider myself as a person who works with the Chinese community, who do the intercultural mediating. So um, before, and I've never thought about this, this, this question, but it's true that the question reminds me uh, a, a discussion that we have, we have had in the Chinese diaspora of Spain group that we have a WhatsApp group. So once it's like two years, one year ago, we talked about this, uh, this issue. And I remember that a friend, I, uh, if I remember correctly, it was Berna, the panelist of last round table. She said, she said that she read a sentence about activism, which, which she was very agreed with. The sentence was, you are doing activism with your mere existence. And I think the sentence is quite right because 
maybe I'm thinking I'm doing activism with um, with uh, when, when I protect my family in a intercultural conflict, or maybe when I'm doing activism when I try to defend the Chinese families that, that are going through economic difficulties or social injustice, or maybe also I'm doing um, I'm doing uh, um, I'm doing uh, the. The, the, the activism when I publish things on Instagram, mm -hmm. Instagram against, uh, for example, against the racism. So uh, it depends on how you of activism, and, mo and maybe all of us we are doing activism in our daily daily, daily life by uh, by doing something very small, some small actions. So, yeah. Thank you, Ines. Uh, yeah, I, as, as them, I think that activism is a strong word. And also, uh, I think that uh, it means like fighting again, against injustices. And in that way, I think activism is too philosophical because you can do activism in many ways. Like there is not a proper way to do activism. You can do activism in the streets or on internet. And also, um, in your daily life, like your little actions can be part of activism. For example, uh, I don't know if if I think if I think in Rose Park, the woman, the black woman who didn't get up from a seat uh, in order to let a white uh, man or woman sit down. I think that's a strong and a powerful move for for the activism. So I think that everybody can can do activism. And I don't know if I, I refer to myself as an, as an activist, because uh, when I started all this project, I thought that I just was sharing like my ideas or my experiences, and I didn't thought that it was activism. But when people uh, start referring at me, they said to me that I was an activist. And I don't know, maybe uh, all of us are because I think that speaking out, it's uh, a really a strong way to do activism. Actually, I just to find the person activist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know you were saying, sorry? No, totally agree with, with uh, what the Ines said. So just do something, small thing every day. Yeah. I really like the comment of um, being an activist by, by doing activism just by existence. And I think it's very accurate in many ways. Yeah, it's... Um, one of the things that I would like to discuss is the question of whose responsibility is to speak. Uh, Ines, you just said about the idea of speaking out. So I would like to address the question of speaking about representing the experience of racialized communities. Mm -hmm. So in, mm -hmm. for you, what would you consider the do's and don't of, for those who want to be effective allies? Um, well, I think that, yeah, I, I don't know, I don't mind. <laughs> like in all type of fights, uh, everybody could be an ally or could empathize with uh, maybe a fight that don't connect at all with them. But uh, uh, I think um, any help is, is necessary. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the main or the principal voice uh, in this case uh, is from uh, the one who are oppressed and they have to be listened because uh, I think uh, in fight terms, it's, they have to lead the revolution because um, they are the one who have been suffered all the time, this type of actions, uh, racist actions. And one of the don'ts uh, from an effective ally or it's to uh, say to them that what is, act, what is racist or what is not of if we tell a, a person that we have suffered a situation that is racist, that they uh, tell us that is um, overreact, maybe. I think that uh, we can we can thought uh, we can think in an, in the idea of a, a man taking part of like the main speech of uh, of the feminism. So I think in the same way uh, we can think in a white person. Uh, being the main or the principal voice of uh, anti-racist speech. I'm totally agree with uh, with Ines. 
um, yeah, it's it's totally valid valid that uh, other people try to help, try to support, try to uh, uh, repost, for example, on Instagram. That's all kinds of uh, valid support, and we appreciate it. But it's true that sometimes uh, regional people we need spaces to speak out. In, for example, in the academic area, in public, in politician, um, yeah. I think it's if you if we talk if we talk of representation, it should be the racialized people who speak out for themselves. And for for example, um, I also just like Ines said, don't try to uh, don't try to deny the experience that we have had as uh, racial racialized bodies, because I've also been through some situations, um, uncomfortable uncomfortable situations when we racialized people, Chinese people, talking about the experience that we've had as, 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 as immigrants. And some people just stand it out and pointed that we are generalizing and we are overreacting and there is no racism in this society. And that, that's, not, that's not right. Um, we just need our space. So some, sometimes we, we talk, about, talk, about, talk a lot about uh, secure spaces because sometimes we people need some secure space to talk about our issues and not being criticized of being overreacting or something like that. So um, yeah, that's my, my point of view. Thank you for your both point of view. I think I have nothing more to say, but I, I would like to, to thank all the allies because uh, for me, the ally is a, is a very good, uh, very good uh, starting point mm -hmm. to be an ally, but you have a, a long way to, to run and to learn uh, because everyone is allied for other causes. And if you want to be allied for the Chinese community or the Asian community, you have to learn a, a lot about Asia. I think it's very interesting, especially in relationship a conversation that I had with Mary Kate very recently, mm -hmm. that if, the, if we only leave the if we don't participate as allies in a way, for me it's also a little bit conflicted because that would mean that the whole um, fight of fighting the, against racism will be for racialized people and not for the whole community. Um, in case, for example, of the later events on, on Georgia, uh, there's a need of a collaboration be uh, not it cannot be only for Asian communities the one who protest. So I think in there's like a constant struggle in that sense. Mm -hmm. yep. um, we are going to change a little bit the conversation about uh, speaking of speaking about and representation, and I would like to talk about the. Um, about China. China as economic superpower has increasingly been the focus of media attention. Do you feel the pressure to respond to this with your, with your work? So let me start that because I'm on, more on the, on the business world. So yes, I arrived uh, to Spain like uh, 30 years ago in 1990s. And the, the image of China was the, as a poor country, everything made in China was cheap, bad, and yes, cheap and bad. And now it's like, okay, all the good technology comes from China, uh, the rich investors come uh, from China, the rich tourists come from China. So the perception has changed. So that's my, my point of view, uh, what I see. When I ask now for, uh, to a friend, how do you see China? Oh, okay, they are rich, they are very uh, uh, powerful now in the international areas, but uh, still have no more, than, more information than what the media says about China. Mm -hmm. mm, in my field, for example, people don't ask me a lot about China as an economic superpower because in the social field, um, people, the, the, work, the social workers they are facing with another another type of Chinese families that uh, different from the, the image that you see on TV. For example, I remember once that a social worker asked me if there are any types of Chinese families in Madrid because she was so surprised one day when she saw a, a Chinese person doing, working out in the, in the gym of her neighborhood. 
she was surprised because she never see a rich Chinese, uh, uh, yeah, there are rich people, but in, in her image, in, in her imagination, the Chinese people who, the Chinese, the Chinese families, they are, they are, they come from working class, they have economic difficulties. So it depends so, um, so much on the context that you live, you work. People have different perceptions of what chi Chinese people is. Maybe they can see other things on the TV, but that doesn't depends a lot uh, on the environment mm -hmm. that you live. Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, I think that uh, as they have said, China have uh, we we have, we see China with uh, in an image or a conception. But even that image have changed, as Antonio said, uh, I think that uh, um, nowadays also in the media, we also see China as the uh, country with the uh, worst parts of communism or capitalism, but we don't see anymore. We don't, we don't see like other problems, other resolutions for this country. And um, anyway, I think that of course, uh, we can't deny that China has become one of the superpowers, but uh, I don't feel the pressure of talking about that because it doesn't affect like uh, people like us. I think that the state or uh, can be can make uh, her own decisions, but um, the problem is always uh, with us, like um, that we are racialized, that we. Uh, can get jobs because our physical character is. So in that way, uh, I I don't feel that pressure. But of course, there is a bad image of of China that the media have shown to us. In regard of the um, media portrait of China, I would like to follow up um, with bringing to the conversation a comment made by Dr. Pedro Cavadas at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Referring to his daughters uh, who are adopted from China, he said, I can't talk about China because I have two Chinese daughters. Could you talk about the idea suggested by the comment which is that the one's perspective can be validated by the family connection? As I said before, it's a, it's a good starting point. Like I have a Chinese family, Chinese friend, but you, you, you cannot stay there. You, can, you have to go deeper. It's like, uh, I'm not homophobic because I have uh, gay friends. So the, it sounds like not good enough. Mm -hmm. You have to learn more about everything to talk about that. Yeah, also, um... For example, I cannot I cannot say that I can talk about everything about China being Chinese. I've I've re, I've I was raised up in China and I came to Spain with fourteen years old. But but still, uh, when we talk about some some issues, some some uh, some some questions, I may not say that I can talk about China because China has a large history. It's it's huge and uh, it's diff it's culturally very different from one area to another and uh, the, 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 the political system is too different. And also the value system is very different from the Western one. So we, I think we can never say that we can um, talk about one thing just because we know a little bit about it. Mm -hmm. And for me, as an adopted uh, daughter uh, who lives in a white family, I think that the, the idea suggested uh, from this doctor is totally wrong and dangerous because as they have said, uh, I think that uh, the, their daughters are different people. So he is still being white and he is still uh, living in Europe and he don't know about the context of China. He don't know, uh, he doesn't know anything about uh, being Chinese or being racialized and the problems of the suffer that uh, it brings. So I don't think uh, that two ideas that he have made a uh, match. I cannot hear I, Yeah, good. Sorry, <laughs> I was muted. Uh, Ines, you also mentioned that uh, in he in another statement, in the first, in another statement, he kind of uh, give a portrayed about China that was negative? Do you want to speak about that? Yeah, of course. Um, 
well, uh, he said in the same interview uh, on television that uh, her daughters, uh, well, her, his daughters uh, could not suffer from coronavirus uh, because they uh, had lived uh, in an orphanage uh, like for a year, so like in a survival way. And I don't get that correlation. It means that uh, all other children uh, would not suffer from from coronavirus. And it is not also that idea. He said that uh, uh, they uh, don't have to be vaccine, get the, the vaccine. Okay, um, thank you. Um, I think this is bring the conversation also to, to COVID-19. And the first month of the pandemic uh, in 2020 were deci decisive for the tennis community all around the world. Antonio and Juve, could you speak about the, the reaction of the tennis communities of Spain uh, to this and your involvement in it? Antonio, you, uh, you briefly mentioned um, the picture of, of no, sorry, un virus, if you want to start mm -hmm. talking about that connection. Yes. Thank you, uh, Moises. Yes, that was an idea come up with a, a group with Susana, uh, Berna, and um, Paloma Chen. And, and Gazpacho Agridulce, you already had here in, in the seminar. So we said, okay, we feel responsible to, to do something for the Chinese community. So then we come up with like a, a very silly piece of paper saying, I'm not a virus in Spanish. Mm -hmm. Because in, in that time, a lot of people start to say, uh, okay, it's a Chinese virus, it's virus Chino. And it makes people to think if you are Chinese, you have the virus. So our intention was stopping that. And uh, it's, it's got great because all the media in, Sp in Spain, uh, all the, the media, like a newspaper, or the TV channels, make echo of that information. So it was fantastic. Like, uh, I think the first time they, they, they put all the whole uh, conversation into the, the piece of newspaper, um, they, they didn't lie about what we say. So very thankful for, for that. I think Moises had to just briefly, uh, yeah, switch spots because of his Wi-Fi connection. So I was just here keeping watch over, over everything from the shadows. <laughs> He's back. Are you back? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you want to continue? Sorry. Yeah. Um, me, as I work as a media, uh, intercultural mediator who works face to face with the Chinese community, especially in the in the in the Chinese in the Chinatown, we can say. So uh, uh, we have experienced different faces uh, during this one year and a half. And for example, in the beginning of the of the pandemic, it was like January and February when the virus virus came out in China, and there was no virus still. In, in Europe, in the West, in the West world, um, the racism against Chinese people and Asian people just increased during those months. We heard from people that children are suffering from racism in their playground because the other that the other children call them virus. And we also saw that there was a news about an Asian American guy being attacked physically in, in Madrid. And also we hear about that people around us, uh, Asian people, Chinese people were, um, were verbally, uh, ver uh, verbal, they, they received verbal attacks also in, in the city of Madrid and other cities. So that was the, the one uh, a phenomenon that came out in, during the beginning of the pandemic. But in the meanwhile, there's also another peculiar phenomenon inside the Chinese community. It was, um, it was just, uh, the, the virus came out when it was, still Chinese New Year in China. So there, there were a lot of people who, who, were, who were coming back from China after the celebrations, uh, coming from China to Spain. So those people, they did a thing which is quite, uh, uh, which is quite peculiar. They just, uh, they self-parented themselves uh, for 14 days just, um, without any obligation of the Spanish government. They did it because they don't want to, to be the people, the person who, who spend the virus in case of they have the virus. So those people, they self quarantine themselves and other Chinese people, we try to, the, the associations, they try to donate food, donate uh, masks, donate protection, donate money for those people who are in self-quarantine. So 
you can see the comparison, the context from this, those two phenomena. And also after that, there also the, the, there have been a lot of movements inside the, the, inside the Chinese community, for example, also, we talked about uh, the, the free sharing of masks and, uh, and protection materials. It was March or April, I think, and uh, Chinese people started to uh, distribute freely masks and protective materials for Spanish people, for, for, for all, all, the, all the society in Madrid. It, it, begins, it started in Madrid and also it's, it's spread it to other cities. People just doing it voluntarily. Mm. And we receive different comments about that. Some people say that uh, that uh, some people are thankful, and other people they may make critics saying that you are doing this because you bought all the max at the beginning of at the beginning of the pandemic because we bought it uh, to send it to China because that moment there was no virus elsewhere but in China, so people just try to buy all the protection. So. Yeah, there are different comments, critics about this movement, and 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 therefore we see the the movement that Antonio just have said. The, I'm not a virus. So the Chinese community, we can say that we have lived in very different phases and very different reactions and along all this year. Yeah, and, and also the, in WeChat, there are a, a lot of groups between Chinese doctors and Spanish doctors and with a huge good work of the uh, translator, volunteer translator to mm -hmm. passing all the information from China to Spain. So it, it was great, the, the moment to help him, to, to supporting everyone for mm -hmm. the cause, yes? Yeah, and also in the meanwhile, there's, there were still politician people making use Always. of the virus and saying that, yeah, making it even worse, the situation against Chinese people, yeah. In a way, those comments that you're referring to, uh, Yue, are part of the reason why we created all this project in order to give some um, visualize to the situation. At the same time, um, I wanted to bring up in, in conversation to what you just said, um, that the Cide Bella, um, um, Black author in, in Spain, she expressed that for her, that situation that you were talking about where the Chinese communities had to, uh, well, the Chinese communities make those donations were part of a necessity that the, the, that the Spain was doing to, um, a necessity of those communities to clear their image after the, um, the perception of the, the virus coming from China. So it was that she was claiming that um, they feel um, a necessity of, of responding to that or responding to that, um, to the, those claims. I think it, sh it would be a mix of all different causes. Yeah. Mm, you cannot see people, uh, we, are, we are also people, we are also human. And you cannot see people suffering when they are left, they have left. Of, of masks in the hospitals. That moment um, in the Chinese community, they are, they are collecting masks inside the Chinese community to donate them to the hospitals because there are also news saying that there is, a, there is a huge lack of masks and protections in the hospitals. So in, on the other side, maybe there is a sense of, of self-protection, as you said, because there is, there is a lot of violence against Chinese for Chinese community and maybe there is a lot of little bit of that sense to uh, to, to wash your image but in the other sense it's it's just um empathy it's just want to help people want to uh, because it's all it's also our home for many of Chinese people Asian people this uh, space also our home we live here we have families here and we go to hospitals so we don't want to see people suffering and it's it's totally it's totally understandable that People help people. It's that simple, I think. Yes, I may have, um, I may not express myself well. What she was saying is that it's not that um, they were um, trying to, um, that they were responding to a, that Spain was imposing on them, on, on Chinese communities, the image of they bring the, the virus. So they had 
and impose responsibility of responding to that. And also, I would like to um, bring the conversation also to uh, one of other event that that happened, which is the in the case of uh, Ines, you co-created the anti racism Asiatico during last year. What mm -hmm. motivated you to establish this platform and what did you hope to achieve with it? Um, well, it's true, I started this project after the pandemic because it was on August 2020, but it not was the main reason. Um, I, I haven't lived like all the experiences uh, that you or Antonio have, have said because I am not like too connected to the Asian community here in Spain. But of course, uh, the pandemic uh, and all the racist uh, actions that take part and are taking part, uh, help, help me to start this project. But I think that the main reason was uh, um, I, that I feel angry and I felt angry uh, when, I, uh, when people don't see like the Asian racism because they see Asian like funny or um, cute and they don't think that, that we could should, uh, we could suffer racism in the way that Latin or Black people uh, do. Of course, uh, they do, and I support all uh, their fights. But we we also do, and I think it's important to uh, visi visibly uh, that that movement. So. Uh, on my personal account on Instagram, I have followed uh, for many years, like uh, many accounts uh, anti-racist, but I didn't like um, found anyone that could, uh, uh, which I could feel represented at all, or because also I am adopted. So I, th I, I have always thought that I can't feel part of anything like, uh, neither to the Asian community at all and uh, neither to, to any of these accounts. So I decided to start myself this project because I thought that it was important to see other people uh, that there are many people that feel like as, as I am and who are adopted and feel alone in their towns, in their cities, because uh, they uh, are growing in white families and in white families, even they have uh, Asian uh, daughters or sons, uh, there is racism. And, and we have to uh, try to combat it and also to deal, to know how to deal with these, these type of things because of course, when it comes from your family, uh, hearts deeper. Thank you, Ines. I think it's very interesting the that you have received um, very good um, answers and very good feedback during the whole project. So I would like to continue follow up with what do you consider uh, your greatest accomplishment uh, related to your work on the Chinese experience in Spain? In your case, uh, it will be related to the to the project. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you, Antonio, you could also uh, talk about uh, your the. Um, or either Liwai or the, the work that you are doing. So okay. what is your um, greatest accomplishment so far? Um, in, in my case, I sincerely, I would say that I have, added, I have hadn't done any great accomplishment until, until now because I'm still so young and this project, the project that I, that I started Liwai is also so young, it's, it's two years old and we are in a very initial phase and we'd like to do bigger and better projects with the, with the Chinese community, for example, in Madrid, in the, in the capital. But right now we are fighting for, for financial support, for more, uh, for more official support to do those uh, projects. And until now, we are just doing some small activities, uh, some small projects with, with young people. And I think that's not enough. I would like to do more. And I think I, we, we will, we, we will, we are able to do more. So we need spaces and we just need, yeah, we just need space to develop ourselves. Yes, too much is never enough for, for that kind <laughs> of things. Uh, I do contribute with my uh, training sessions to Spanish people and Chinese people to make them like think different, uh, change their mindset 
about the Chinese people, how to work with them, and just give me give them more knowledge to understand uh, how Chinese works. So that is my biggest contribution in these <laughs> recent years. And well, I, I think uh, that also I'm on an initial phase, uh, but um, I, I don't know. I, I feel grateful for being uh, giving voice like in spaces like like this, mm -hmm. and also to start creating like a little community of people who support each other, and also not uh, only Asian people, also white people who have started to visibilize uh, other uh, Asian problems that maybe they hadn't thought about, and so I feel uh, happy for that and, and grateful. Yeah, I'd also want to add something to that. For example, we are lately saying that there are a more and more Asian movements uh, online and offline then, and, and there wasn't any 10 years ago, for example. And when I was a teenager, I, I'd like to find someone who is doing what we're doing right now, mm -hmm. all these accounts, all these movements, all these uh, uh, projects. There was, uh, there, there was none. So, um, as the second generation, as the young people, the 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 the, the, the or the first generation born in Spain, they grew up, and uh, now now we have we are able and we have the capacity to uh, insert ourselves to the Spanish society. So we are we are now capable to speak out for our community. So I think it's a very it's a very great grateful thing to see what is just happening now. So and any and. Yeah, we are in a very initial phase actually in Spain uh, in general uh, about activism, about social mo uh, movements, but we are starting it. I, th I think that is really useful, really um, valid and useful, yeah. I must say that you are all very humble because even though uh, you have accomplished a lot and the same issue of the, the, the all the conversation that we are having are speaking to that. Um, that's the way that we all get to know your work. So <laughs> if, uh, the platforms uh, could be uh, young and you are young. Um, there are um, great achievements that you got, that you got, um, that you, you made it, you made happen. So, um, I would like to talk about how, um, when we are talking about achievements, we could talk about small or big scale achievements. So in order to um, talk about those big uh, scale, in the mm -hmm. US it's very common to see activists mobilizing legislator to push some laws. What kind of public activities could be done in Spain? And what answers have, have been received? Mm, okay, I can start with this question. And in, in Spain, we have a peculiar situation here in the Chinese community because the Chinese people, uh, most, the, the majority of the Chinese community are dedicated to business, to shops. They have, for example, the bazaars, which is one dollar shop, and the alimentaciones. So um, this, they, they work a lot, they, they work, um, very much during the day, they work from nine o'clock or ten o'clock until the in, in twelve uh, p.m. So, so there is a lot of violence in this sense to those to those commercials to those business um, due to thefts, uh, robberies. These are things that the news or television don't talk about that lot. We just solve it inside our community. But it's a real big problem to, for us because we live in an insecure environment. We live in a very insecure situation. So I know that it's been years that a lot of Chinese associations, they've been, they've been uh, having meeting with the polit politicians, with the policemen, in, for, example, for example, in Madrid, also in Valencia and other cities, they maintain meetings with politician people just to solve this problem. And I think it's taking very slow and small, small steps in this case. Antonio, do you want to talk about this? Well, I don't, don't have much information about that, but 
I know the thinking in Spain uh, uh, goes very slowly, and now they have uh, the politicians have uh, another priorities. I think it's now you know uh, like uh, last year, the people blamed on the Chinese people because we bring the virus, and now they are blaming blaming to their politicians because they are not doing the right work. So I think that they are the focus in other way. So. I don't know if they have time to, to solve this kind of problem. Mm -hmm. Ines, do you... Yeah, um, well, I, I don't know actually uh, what specific um, actions are taken in the US, uh, but um, maybe I, I can find similarities because uh, anyway, after all, the population um, in all countries have, have always asked uh, to the state uh, for proposals when they feel un uncomfortable or they are not satisfied about law or in just these situations. But of course, uh, the Asian community here in Spain is, is little than, for example, in the US. And I think that we are starting to now to, to propose this type of things because maybe in the US uh, there are more generations than, than here in Spain because it is uh, uh, new here, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's a big difference between the US and Spain because the here we have the second or, or the, the third, but in US maybe it's the fifth, sixth, or seventh. Mm -hmm. So uh, the history, the immigrant history is different and the steps that we've taken also, uh, there is a difference. And also I think there is uh, another uh, big uh, difference is that uh, the, the Asian people, the Chinese people, we are not used to, 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 to participate politically. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that I'm right now learning uh, at my work uh, with, with all these events that, that we are doing. I see that it's important to participate, to participate actively in, in political, to change our lives. But uh, the Chinese community is, is so silent and maybe it will take more time to, for us to speak out more. Yeah. Yes, you, I just, uh, I, uh, last week I saw like a, a piece of paper in, in, on Facebook and saying, if you are um, Spanish, uh, you, if you have Spanish uh, nationality, go mm -hmm. to vote. Your, your vote yeah. counts. So it's like yeah. a call to action to the Chinese people to your vote um, also counts. So please go there because it's also your country, your responsibility. Yeah. yeah. This, uh, this is the first time I, I, I see it. Um, it's very interesting. We are having this conversation in a university platform. And Antonia, you work in, 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 at the university, and uh, Ines, you work at the school. You, you also work, uh, you also got uh, educational programs. So I would like to ask, what actions would you consider appropriate for educators to take uh, in order to fight uh, against anti-Asian sentiment and the violence that it can cause? So also, do you feel that this is an obligation of the um, educators itself, or it should come from uh, legislation above that? I think it should come from your family, uh, your teachers, you know. I, I, for me, it's like a, it's a, a everyone's a responsibility to fight mm -hmm. against racism, not only uh, toward the Asian people. I think it's uh, the way I'm thinking, it's my mindset. I don't know if uh, Ines has another different opinion. No, I, I think the same. And also I think that institutions have started to punish these actions uh, because many times they, they say that there is a child theme, but it's not. We have to call it by its name, it's racism. And we have to combat it because, uh, okay, in Spain, I don't know it's the same in the US, but here we study uh, physical education but we, I think the physical education is the same important as the mental health. Like you have to be okay with yourself. So that means that you maybe need a emotional education, I don't know, or anti-racist education. Because um, um, may, many people don't think, uh, think that racism is only physical violence, but it's not. And, uh, psychological hits uh, hard deeper than physical ones sometimes. 
And when people insult, insult you, that's violence. Um, when people use racist expressions or do or, or uh, jokes, or joke, yeah, or jokes, jokes about you, yeah, that's violence. When they people you do like something like that, also it's violence, and we suffer it because we are we are children and uh, we don't we feel uh, misunderstood, and also uh, we think that it's our fault. And the point is that it is not our fault and we don't have to feel guilty for, uh, for being who, who we are. So in that way, I think the system has to change this and have to start to uh, educate uh, themselves in anti-racism. In anti -racism. And if they don't know how to do this, uh, they can, I don't know, invite organizations that are specializing this type or uh, bring activists to schools that may, and this is also a good thing because children would see uh, uh, other experiences of life. Uh, maybe they would thought about, about it. And um, when uh, I work in school uh, in the canteen, like helping other people uh, to the children and that, and it is not common to see a Chinese person uh, working in a canteen. So many children have love about me, but the teachers uh, don't do nothing. And I feel really sad about it because, uh, I don't know, I am Asian, but I can be uh, not only in a bazaar, I can be in a school uh, or uh, in a hospital and in all, all spaces are for us too. So we have to learn that, I think. It's the danger of, of biases you, you, you have when you're a kid. So mm -hmm. if you don't uh, correct or teach them to mm -hmm. be more correctly, so it's mm -hmm. the danger when they grow up, so be, become, then become a, uh, they, they become like a, a, a racist person. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I am 100% agree with them. Um, yeah, the education is, uh, is, is basic for, for educating people who respect each other. And in the case of educators, I think maybe, for example, in Spain, maybe there is a lack of, uh, of diversity formation or intercultural formation for all the educators, professors. For example, I personally, I've experienced racist situation in the university and also uh, in, at school. So I think they uh, all, well, not only educators or, or, or teachers, but also all the public servants or the, the service, civil servants, they should have uh, received a diverse a, a course about diverse, about intercultural, interculturalism or multiculturalism uh, to, to learn about what Spain is right now because Spain is diverse. Spain mm -hmm. is com it, it, it's formed by different people from different cultures, and we we are all here living here. This is our home, and many people that just don't realize and don't want to accept that reality. And also, as I'm re I'm working as an intercultural mediator, I see that people are people are are um, people. They experience racism also in the public services. So, what should we do? We just we should begin with um, to form them first, to form the servants, to form the professors, to form the teachers, not to be racist mm -hmm. first, and then they can teach other people to, to teach the children, teach their their uh, their workmates how to not to, how to not be racist. Yeah. Thank you very much, Joe. It's, uh, it's the first time that we are um, on time and uh, we only have one question left, so we are going to be able to make them all. So, <laughs> uh, we have talked about different levels of racism and you just spoke about racism in the in classrooms. So I would like to ask, uh, given that you speak from, uh, many of you have spoken about this issue from your own experiences, what references or advice would you uh, share with a young person who is struggling with racism and question about their own identity? Okay, I can start with that. Um, for example, I would say that everything that we're doing here, this event, this project, or all these projects that you people and we are doing from the UI, 
these are things references that the young people, the children can look at and can learn from. And they, I think that um, is one of our main main aims and main goals of our projects as well. Um, for example, I can I can advise uh, um, projects like that that are not even that are not invited to this uh, project as Katatsia, which is a um, which is a Asian descent collective. And also, anti-racism asiatico. It's a great account for the adopted people, uh, uh, girls, ad adopted children, and also for all the Asian people. And also, another another one is Pai Pai Magazine. Pai Pai Magazine is also an Asian mag uh, online magazine from and for Asian collective. And also, Tusanahe was invited here too. And yeah, and last and not not least. And our one Li Wai, we are going also. We are going to do a lot of offline activities and events and the projects in, in Madrid. So, uh, children, teenagers, if you want to, uh, yeah, you you can you can just come to join us and talk with us, and we are uh, we can we we will try to help you. That that's our yeah that's our job that's our work and that's our aim yeah. We will share this. Oh, uh, sorry. No, only sorry uh, that I, we are having the the links on on the chat, but we are mm -hmm. going to also put them on all the references. We, it's going to be also on the YouTube video. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, so Ines, would you like to continue? Ah, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think uh, to add, uh, I would say that uh, every person could be a good reference. Uh, it is not, maybe uh, sometimes we think in famous people, but it's, they have to be famous, a reference, because uh, I don't know, uh, the, the Asian man who works uh, in a shop in your town could be your reference, or people who feel the same way as you do, um, because they have suffered the same, uh, could be your reference. I think it's, it's important to us to meet other people near you that could help could help you I could support you um, because it's it's nice to feel love and uh, not not only to do activism <laughs> and uh, in the in uh, on the other hand uh, for me it's difficult to give in advices uh, because I am not therapist so maybe for I don't know for you it's different but when people ask to me uh, what I advices could I give them uh, I don't know what to say uh, but uh, I try to to let them speak and to empathize with them and to uh, tell them that it's okay to feel angry and to feel sad when they suffer this type of uh, racism. And also it's okay to, to ask for help when you need it because yeah. any, anyone can need help in a moment and it is not bad and you are not uh, uh, like your value is, is not less because you are uh, asking for help because anyone have asked for help uh, in a moment and that's okay. Totally agree, Ines, thank you. Uh, I would like to say uh, it's great to, to find someone to be a reference, but it's better to become a, a reference yourself. I mm -hmm. would recommend yeah. a, a very good book from my, my, my good friend, Daya Roxon. Mm -hmm. uh, the book says, uh, use your difference to make a difference. So just find the difference in, in, in yourself. It's not a bad thing. Uh, uh, just uh, find that uh, it's a benefit for you. And use the different to make a difference, to become like a, a, res, a reference for everyone. So super recommended this book. Use yeah. your, re uh, yes. <laughs> use your difference to make a difference by Dario Roxanne. With this um, well, sorry. Uh, no, you, you. <laughs> Yeah, talking talking about differences, I and um, I see that it's quite normal uh, in 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 children who were born here in Spain or in United States that they have identity conflicts. They sometimes have um, an yeah. identity anxiety, and, and I would say that uh, it's you can you it's, it's normal. You can just. Uh, let it go and when you are in the age when you're ad adult maybe you will see that it's not a disadvantage but on uh, the opposite so it's not a problem and try to open you up just as Nina said open yourself and try to meet people to talk about it and to ask for help yeah 
Uh, I was going to uh, to talk also about identity and pro identity problems, and I think um, that uh, maybe uh, uh, we uh, when a Chinese uh, girl or boy uh, grow in Spain, being different, uh, he thinks he have to choose one like or Chinese or Spanish, but you have not. It's like you can be both because your identity maybe is more complex than the others and it is not bad it's it's good because it it it's your identity and you have to be um like you have to be powerful with that and i don't know also uh, as antonio i would yeah. like to recommend a book like uh, <laughs> it is from amin malouf in in spanish is yeah. identidad asesinas see sí, mm -hmm. i don't know mm. what the name in english but when I read, read it, I feel um, understood because it talks about being abroad and being in many countries. And, and I thought like, yeah, maybe I, I don't have to choose one. Maybe I'm, I'm all of my experiences. Like I was born in China, but then I grew up in Spain and all of this formed part of my, my life. Thank you very much, Ines. Uh, and I want to, to comment on what on the book that Antonio mentioned, the idea of, um, I haven't read the book, but in a way it seems that you all have applied this um, motive be even before you read it. Uh, with this, I would like to open the space for request for Q&A. And I think we are going to start with Iki Tam, professor from <clears throat> Stony Brook. He is also the chair of um, Asian and uh, Asian American studies. And he asked, with your work in advocating and supporting Chinese community in Spain and addressing discrimination and racism, do you work with other Asian advoc advocacy uh, groups? If so, what are um, some projects or events, events or initiatives that you collaborated on? Is the question in the chat or it's oh, uh, it's, uh, oh, it's not in the chat? Uh, it, it was a private message, sorry. <laughs> ah, okay. So the, the question is if we collaborate with other Asian projects in yes. Spain, in our Spain. Yes, like mm -hmm. non-Chinese non Asian um, mm -hmm. communities. Yeah, the, the ones that I, for example, I've mentioned, Catarsia. Uh, Gatarza is an Asian collective, and with this uh, project, with this uh, collective, we've done things together. For example, in 2019, in Madrid, we've organized a big, a huge event for Chinese diaspora, um, for different pro profiles, Chinese people. So yeah, we do some collaboration with also with Asian collectives. And this is one of those that I know. And there is another, which is a Pai Pai Magazine. Um, and I don't know more. Asian projects so far. Ines or Antonio? Uh, no, not in my case. I don't collaborate with any other uh, organizations. Neither do I. Okay. For example, in the in the Chinese diaspora, we also sometimes collaborate with other other racialized collectives as the African, we, we, in Spain we call it Afro, I don't know if in, in, in English you also call it that way, the Afro community, um, we also collaborate with them. And also the Latin uh, collective, we are trying to connect and do something together. Yeah, we are trying to start with some alley from now, but start step by step, little by little, yeah. <laughs> Um, Mary Kit is going to continue with the Q&A and please uh, to all the guests, uh, feel free to post your questions on the chat. Yeah, so we have had a few questions come in already. I'm actually, um, but please feel free to add some more. I'm gonna follow up with a question from David George because I think it's related and you might've already answered it in your response that you just gave to E.K. Tang. But um, David George was wondering if you have points of contact interaction or does your work have um, with Chinese and Asian communities elsewhere in Europe? So not just in Spain, but elsewhere in Europe or with the United States. Do you have a kind of dialogue with other Asian communities elsewhere? <laughs> None of us. Um, yeah, this is the first international event that we are participating in. 
<laughs> One thing that I was thinking about is even your work with the hashtag no soy un virus, even if mm -hmm. it wasn't a kind of direct collaboration, I think in a sense, I mean, I know, Antonio, your post um, was kind of picked up by social media platforms and mm -hmm. kind of placed in dialogue with the French hashtag, with the English hashtag. And so in that way, I think there is some kind of... Of connection, of course. Uh, and yeah. I think it's the TV from the Russian uh, called me for an interview. Also a magazine from Finland. Um, and then a, a TV program from Venezuela. Mm -hmm. So that makes huge. Uh, even BBC makes an echo for, from that picture. So wow, I'm very great. proud of, of the campaign. Um, we also had a question from Justin Ullman that came in kind of at the beginning of the conversation when we were talking about um, responding to the rise of China as a global superpower. And mm -hmm. he asked, do you feel the difference in quote unquote fear of China's growth between Spain and the US is due to the different political relationships of the countries or due to the lack of exposure to ethnic Chinese minority members in Spain versus the US? So I think no, that also, no, I think, yeah. yes, please continue. No, I mean, I think that the way I understood that question is also kind of related to what Dwey was saying about the difference in the multiple generations. So whether that yeah. response to China as a superpower, as a global superpower is also related to the different history of migration, the different mm -hmm. history of Chinese and Chinese descendant communities. Yes, I think it's, it's like, like um, a little bit of lack of information from Spain. As you said, uh, we are just the second generation. Like my, my, my father was the, one of the first Chinese men to arrive to, to Spain in 1984-83. So there was like 1,000 of Chinese people uh, in Spain. And now we are like a, uh, two, how many are we? So in Spanish, we say 200,000, which is a quarter of a million, more or less. Yes. Yeah. It's less than more. So uh, we don't even have the, the voice to, to speak up and mm -hmm. anything. Yeah, and I, th I think um, Justine is trying to say that uh, it seems that there is more racism against Asian people in Europe more than in Spain, right? I think that was the point. So. Um, yeah, I think it, uh, it's not because the lack of exposure to, to Chinese community, because Chinese community is everywhere in Spain. <laughs> we have shops in every street, in every neighborhood. So they know Chinese people, and, uh, but they have a lot of um, uh, stereotypes of how Chinese people is. And just as I said, many people, especially the older people, they don't connect the Chinese community instead with the China. And also it's, I think it's also uh, logical that uh, it also affects the, 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 the relationship between US, China, mm -hmm. China and Spain, China. Because maybe you see more, more negative news in US than we see in Spain. That's totally possible because the media um, just uh, manipulates a, a lot and yeah I think he, he, it's a mix of all of these causes yeah mm -hmm. I'm always conflicted when they are speaking in comparison with uh, between Spain and the US uh, mostly because the US is basically a continent compared to, to yeah US. and yeah in the multi-generation I will enter I would like to also to point out to the previous conversation that we had with Paloma Chen, Bernard Wan, and Susana Ye, mm -hmm. which uh, we talk um, broadly about the um, different generations of um, Chinese Spaniards compared to Chinese Americans or Chinese Peruvians, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a long history in Latin America as well. Mm -hmm. Also, I think it's the political issue. Maybe the states like uh, uh, they are number one, and, and China will be the number, also the number one. So that the fighting between them, and maybe the Spain is more much. Uh, um, what 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 can you say? Is this not in the same fight or the same level? Mm -hmm. So maybe that is the kind of, of perception we have here. But if I may, Antonio, when you are talking about the number of Chinese population in Spain. Mm -hmm. How would you make that count? Because, for example, I don't count. <laughs> no, I know, but I mean, 
I, I know your, your question. Uh, I think we, we have an Instituto um, de Estadística mm -hmm. uh, and they are making like a numbers of Chinese with a uh, NIE, with uh, the like a uh, foreign yeah. number and hold uh, no the Spanish ID. So in my case, uh, I hold the Spanish nationality like Ines and we, that's, uh, we don't count like Chinese people. Mm -hmm. so that's, that's, exactly. that's why I said the number like uh, more or less yeah, because I think that that number will not really will not accurately represent the population because yeah. they will be leaving out uh, both the adoptees or or the Spanish-born Chinese, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Also, people hold the 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 not the, uh, the, um, the foreigner ID, uh, and they are not living in Spain. Maybe they are living in another part of the uh, of the Europe. So that's not the reality. Hmm. I'm a little bit lost. Are you talking about the statics uh, about how 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 many popula Chinese population is here in Spain? Yes. 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 Yeah. They, they the are. Real, we the are, real one. Yeah. Uh, the real one. We don't know that. <laughs> the the, the no, registered. No. We are two so, uh, two hundred thousand. Yeah. yeah two hundred thousand in Spain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jeffrey Coleman just added in the chat, and I know that he's familiar with some of these topics because of his own research on um, Afro Spaniards, yeah. uh, Afro, Af um, Afro Spaniards. So he says it's impossible to know how many Asians live in Spain since the national census does not account for race. So mm -hmm. I think there's this question of like nationality ver versus race or ethnicity or heritage. And so those things, as we know, don't always align. You might have a, a national citizenship, but it doesn't really account for some of these other questions of race, ethnicity, heritage, culture, etc. Um, we have another question from Yansu Kim, who asks, do you see any support from institutions to organize anti-racist activities or projects, say from the local governments or companies? Uh, in, in my case, where I used to work for is the district. It's the, uh, the, the district, district council, we can call it. Yeah, it's a council of one over 21 districts of Madrid. So it was a public program where I worked for, but it's suspended for this year. So it's been a program for four years. And um, due to different political issues, it would be suspended one year and react, react it another year. So, yeah, in Madrid, we have this project in, the, in, the, in this district. And in other districts, I know that in the center district, there, there is another intercultural mediation pro program that last, have lasted for years. But there is, there is no one anti-racist or, or, or a mediation program in the city of Madrid that works for all Madrid. There is small projects that, is, that are supported by the government. But I, I know that in Barcelona, there is more projects which are very interesting and are also broad for all the cities. So it depends on the city, depends on the district. It depends also on the government that, on, on the politician, on the, on the politicians, yeah. Uh, I know that, that a lot of um, companies, multinational companies, are doing like a, a, a great labor to hire people to speak about uh, anti-racism uh, topics. Mm -hmm. Like uh, they are they're hiring um, trainings for their employees to how to be more anti-racism. So this is a great movement for this year. So from the private companies, yes, they do hire training for, for that kind of topics. Um, oh, we have another question that just came in from Tanya Verde, who says, in Spain, are Chinese language schools, supplementary Saturday classes, and the formation of Chinese community centers encouraged or supported? Uh, as far as I know, they are supported by the Chinese government instead of the Spanish mm -hmm. government. There are a lot of academies that, uh, that teach Chinese to Chinese children. And I know that uh, a lot of children who are, who are born here, they, they just refuse to go into those schools because Chinese is so difficult. Uh, but they are not supported by, by the Spanish government, but by the Chinese government, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Ines, have you ever been to uh, like a school like this? 
No, no. I, I no. haven't. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just from curiosity. <laughs> but uh, I think it is common for the families, uh, yeah, the families to um, um, sign to their children to Chinese classes. But I don't uh, know any people who nowadays speak properly Chinese. Mm -hmm. I don't know because, one or two cases, but it's not, not yeah. the, the whole thing, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I think we feel uh, embarrassed when we are speaking uh, Chinese because like, it's like uh, we are just different uh, from our families and the children know it and told you that you are different from your family. So we, we, we want to distance from the Chinese community. And it was my case too that uh, all my, when I was a teenager, I didn't want to uh, have any connection with China and neither with the Chinese. So I stopped the classes, what I re regret, but I can't do nothing now. <laughs> uh -huh. It's never too late to learn Chinese. No, it's not late, it's not late. <laughs> Moises is taking Chinese lessons, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a secret. <laughs> Uh, Ines, is your project of uh, language acquisition related to Chinese language? Uh, yeah, a little. It's, uh, well, I really want to focus uh, my project on the processes, like uh, when, when we interact a uh, language, the acquisition, because uh, maybe we are babies and we don't speak Chinese, but it's the first contact that we have uh, made with the world. So our uh, brain structures are taking like Chinese uh, as a reference. And maybe in a, short, in a short time, there isn't any uh, problems because uh, the child is going to uh, learn uh, Spanish or their other uh, second, first language as uh, well. But uh, in a, a large plate of time, uh, it can and appear other linguistic problems uh, because of that. That's so interesting, Ines. Mm -hmm. You have to tell us more about your research when you finish the project. Yeah, I, I am asking uh, people who has been adopted that if they uh, um, remember if they sp spoke uh, Chinese, uh, but there are many who did, it, did that, and the ones who did that, uh, now they don't, they don't speak Chinese. Mm. But I think they will have more facilities if they want to, to um, learn Chinese than other people. Yeah. Um, we have a question that came in from Julia Chang. She says, I noticed that Catarsia has an event on intersectional feminism. Could any of the panelists speak to the engagement with intersectional feminism as it relates to anti-racist efforts in Spain? Actually, in Chinese community, we talk very little about feminism because, for example, in, in Vocera, I tried to encourage Chinese uh, women to participate to the uh, Presentation, how do you say it in English? Uh, a protest, yeah, the, the, the 8th of the 8th of March, uh, trying to encourage them to go to the protest, but there were three or four women uh, out of maybe maybe five thousand. It's very difficult for Chinese people to participate actively, uh, actively in this kind of issues because we are not used to, especially the people we come, who come from China. In China, we don't speak that much about politics. We don't speak that much about feminism, but it's true that lately it's, it's, it started to begin a social issue and people talk um, a little bit more about it, but it takes time, yeah. So in the why um, we haven't uh, organized any event about feminism or that kind of issue. Yeah, that's interesting, the kind of politicization that you were talking about earlier, that maybe there's a change coming in that yeah. sense. Um, Sorry, Ines, mm -hmm. maybe you want to talk a little bit about this because you wrote about um, in in the, pre one of the emails that you sent me said like, uh, Asian women also participate from the feminist um, fight. So I don't know if there's anything that you want to contribute to the conversation. 
Yeah, I I think that uh, we always think in the paradigm, like in a canonical way, and we think that Asia uh, has not move movements uh, or because we always thinking about, uh, I don't know, the paradigm, the canonical paradigm, like Virginia Woolf or Simone de Beauvoir. And it's true that they are important feminism. Um, they have made so great moves, but of course there, there are people in Asia who are fighting against uh, sexism and it's important to not to notice it, I think. No, yeah, the Me Too movement is also right no. now fighting mm -hmm. to Asia in China as well, yeah. So I think we have time for one last question. We're coming right up against the half hour mark. Um, we have a follow-up question from Yan Su Kim who is directing it to Inez specifically. Mm -hmm. She says that I know there are Korean American adoptees who, who organize to oppose adoption. Do you know if there are any similar movement or sentiment shared by adoptees in Spain? Also, do you have plans to write about your experience? Uh, well, I think uh, there is a similarity here in Spain. But I find they uh, interesting because it is not like we are opposed to adoption. It's the, the thing that adoption should not exist because uh, it would be okay that the state give the opportunity to the uh, biological family to stay to, to be with their uh, family uh, for uh, the children to the biological family. So in that way, I think it's the opposition for uh, against adoption. But of course, adoption is a way to protect uh, the children. And um, uh, I think that uh, now in Spain, we are talking more about adoption, but from our side, like the adopted children talking, but because the, the looking is always uh, the, from the side of the parents, like the adopted children are the most wanted, but for whom? I mean, um, if we are adopted, it's because someone uh, didn't want, it, want us or uh, didn't, uh, couldn't take care of us. So our adoption uh, always uh, be begin with a loss. And this is important uh, to talk about because that loss uh, follow us, follows, follow us uh, in our entire life. I think the point of view of the people who has been adopted, it's important. So just share a, a link in, in the in the chat. This means uh, Generación Meiming is a documental made like a, from a, a filmmaker, Spanish filmmaker, uh, talking about all this kind of uh, yeah. uh, like a, a twenty years. Uh, yes, twenty years ago, the people go to China to adopt, and now they, they grow up. So what is about their likes? A very interesting uh, documental yeah. to watch. Mm -hmm. So I saw it. Okay. I think we are going to finish for today. I would like to thank you all for coming, to thank all the speakers and, and all the, the guests that came. I will also want to mention that we are going to keep pensando. We are going to keep pensando the uh, Sibania and we are going to see what other ways we could continue for the following semesters, but we are going um, to keep these alive. So we hope you could keep joining and we are going to post very soon the, the video recording of this event as soon as it's um, edited for, for YouTube. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you. Thanks Thank you a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Thank yeah. you.